Hello, family. I'm Pastor Charles Blake II. Welcome to West Angeles Church of God in Christ. Let's thank God for His grace in allowing us to fellowship once again for the glory of His name. We all exist to be in a relationship with someone, and that someone is Jesus Christ. He's truly what life is all about. At this very moment, we're looking forward to cultivating and growing a meaningful and positive relationship with you. You're not here by accident. It is our hope that someone will be saved today. So stay with us and be blessed.
the glory of God fall down, fall down on us. Oh, fall down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and give the Lord praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. He inhabits the praise of his people. He inhabits the praise of his people. There's strength in your praise. There's lifting in your praise. There's deliverance in your praise. Holy Ghost, take control. We 
Arts Department, who lead us every week right into the very presence of God. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Today, and you may be seated for a minute, I know you've been um, dancing around me too, 
I was trying to keep my cool because I know I had to come up here and I didn't want to be out of breath when I was talking to you. <laughs> but um, today, we honor our veterans. We honor those who are serving now, those who have served, and those who have given their very life for our country, for what they strongly believe in. Thank you to all of you who are here who may have served and are serving. We honor you today. Today makes me also think about the saints that have also served on the battlefield for the Lord. When I first came to West Angeles, I remember a lady by the name of Mother Callahan who used to walk into the church with her hands lifted up and her mouth filled with praise, ready to worship and serve the Lord in whatever way she could. I think of my grandmother who I've talked a lot about, but this morning I was even thinking about my grandfather who only had a third grade education, but he gave his life to the work of the Lord. He was a deacon in the church. And I remember even as a young girl following along with my grandfather, my sister and I, as he would go and pick up the money and go and take it to the bank that was collected on that Sunday. And back then they didn't have the fancy envelopes like we have, they had these little um, yellow, like orangey looking envelopes back then. And we could always smell the food cooking from the basement of the mothers that were preparing the meal for after church. I think about all of them and how they gave their life to what they believed in. They believed in the work that they were doing for the Lord so that little girls like me, and I'm sure a lot of you have grandparents who also did the same, so that you could grow up in admonition of the Lord, and so that you would see them model for you how to serve the Lord. And so I am here this morning so that their legacy all of our grandparents' legacies can continue on and that what they poured in, uh, into us, our love for the Lord, will continue on even past us. And the way that we can make sure that that happens is through our giving. It is offering time. Did you know that when you give, that you are not giving to a person? You're not giving to Pastor Charles, you're not giving to me or Bishop or Lady May. Did you know that? You are giving because that is what God asks all of us to do. And the reason that he asks us to do that is so that his work here on the earth can continue on. It is what you do through your giving that makes that possible. None of us in this room would have anything if it weren't for God. And so I'm gonna ask you, not for a specific dollar amount, I'm gonna ask you to give what you are able to give, what God places in your heart to give, and don't be afraid to ask him, Lord, what is my portion? And don't be afraid to give what he tells you to give. Don't say, oh Lord, that was kind of a lot, I need that. Give what he asks you to give because you can't beat him giving. He said, if we will bring our tithe, those of us who understand what that is, and it's the first 10% of what we earn. He asks us to give the first 10% of what we earn to him, into his storehouse. This is one of his storehouses. And he said to prove him in this, 
that he would pour out blessings that you would have not room to even receive it. So I am going to ask us all to stand now that we've had a chance to catch our breath because I want to pray over what you would be willing to give today. I'm going to pray for both those who are set, who have set aside the tenth and are giving their tithe this morning. I am also praying for all of those who are just giving in the offering your very, very best. Father, here we are as a family, your family, thanking you for calling us to be among your children. We thank you, God, that you have given us a great privilege to give to continue to carry on your work upon this earth. We ask, Lord, that what we have in our hands and release unto you, that you will bless it 30, 60, and even a hundredfold. We ask, Lord, that you will not only bless us this day, but you will bless future generations. Because of our giving today, they will be able to stand here for years to come and hear how much you love them and to serve you just like we are doing today. So we bless you, God. We honor you for all that you are and all that you continue to do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm going to ask all of you, except for the person on the very right end seat of your row, to sit. Pass your offering down to that person and watch it as it goes. As Pastor Charles says, we're all at different places in our walk with the Lord. Make sure it arrives to its designated destination. And the deacons will be there to take your offering from the person on the end. Thank you so very much, West Angeles. We love you.
God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ever ask or think. Hallelujah.
so much going on out there that would seek to steal our peace. But you said you would keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. So Lord God, we put our minds, our hearts, and our trust in you. So we're not going to give up on you, Lord. But Lord, we know that you are not going to give up on us. That as we believe in you, you believe in us. Because you have put something beautiful, you have put something powerful, you've put something special inside of each and every one of your children. So Father God, we lean on you, believing that you and your will are going to bring out that which you have put inside of each one of your children for the building and the benefit of your kingdom. So Father God, we thank you that you still sit on the throne on today. That come what may, Father God, we do not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. So we thank you, Father God, simply for being who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Let's give the Lord praise on today. Well, beloved, it is time for the word. And if you would, please turn with me to 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. Word reads, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city and Saul had put the mediums and the spiritualists spiritists out of the land then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem so Paul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa and when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by the Urim, Urim 
or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Now turn with me to Proverbs chapter three, verse five, where it reads, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Let's give the Lord praise for the reading of his word and you may be seated. <laughs> Beloved, our title for this time is In All Your Ways Acknowledge Him. In all your ways acknowledge him. Now, I've always thought the story of King Saul is one of the more sad and tragic stories in the Bible. When we see him in our text right here, Saul is in his tent, this giant of a man, tall and handsome, the scriptures say. Now he's much older, pacing in his tent completely terrified and desperate. He calls an aide and he says, go find someone who speaks with the dead. Find me a medium. But you see, not too long before that time, Saul had just issued an edict saying, anyone practicing fortune telling, reading tea leaves and crystal balls and tarot cards and all of that. Anybody communing with the dead and all that other craziness will be executed because it goes against Israel's faith in the one true God. And now in his darkest hours, he says, find me someone who is a medium. Huge contradiction right there. They said there's one in Endor, which is real interesting to me because Saul issued an order saying all of them shall be put out and shall be executed. But those who work for him said, oh, well, in fact, there's one right over there on 15th Street. <laughs> how did they know? And if they did know, how come they didn't tell him? Well, anyway, we'll figure that out. But he puts on a disguise fake beard and fake hat and stuff. So no one will know who he is. He, he makes his way to the tent of the medium at Endor in the dead of night and he says to her, I want you to call up someone. She says, you know the law of the land. Are you trying to get me killed? He says, no harm will come to you. Call up someone. She says, well, who is it? He says, call up the prophet Samuel. At that moment, she recognizes him as King Saul and she begins to panic. You, you're King Saul. He said, I said no harm shall come to you. Call up Samuel. And she goes into her ritual and in her ritual, she says, I see some kind of ghostly being coming up out of the ground. Saul says, well, what does it look like? She says, it's him. It's Samuel. And the real Samuel says, why have you disturbed me? Why? Saul says, help me. Tell me what to do. And Samuel says, it's too late. You and your sons will be with me tomorrow. And at these words, Saul crumbles to the floor of the witch's tent, broken crying, unable to move, unable to eat, how would you feel? 
The next day, facing defeat in battle and surrounded by the Philistines, King Saul committed suicide by falling on his sword. All of his sons falling and dying brutally in battle. His life being characterized by his own tragic words, I have played the fool and have erred greatly. Now, beloved, to inquire is to seek information by questioning, to ask direction. Going to inquire or ask directions from a fortune teller was completely unbecoming of a king. It was unethical. In going to a fortune teller, he violated everything he stood for, and it was against the law. Leviticus 19 and 31 reads and commands, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Me personally, I've always said, why look to the stars to tell you what to do when you can have a personal relationship with he who created the stars. I don't have to read tea leaves because I know who created the tea leaves and I can ask him direct. But I can't make any excuses for poor King Saul, but I feel like we need to gain a deeper understanding of what happened there. You see, we never like to identify with the villains or the losers in the Bible. We love to identify with the winners. But if we're not careful, any one of us can end up like Brother Saul. So I began to think about King Saul, Brother Saul, how he went from being anointed king to being this broken man that we see in our text on the floor of a witch's tent. How did someone so close to God find himself in this situation? Then I remembered something. I remembered that Saul didn't ask to be king. You see, there are some people that would love to rule. They would love to be in charge. They fantasize about it. They see all of the accolades and the respect that those in power have, and they wish that they could have that respect, that notoriety. It all looks so good from the outside. But people that want to be in charge too much make me a little nervous. It makes me think that they don't really know too much about leadership that they don't know too much about what it takes or what it takes from you to lead. But Saul was not one of those people. Saul didn't ask to be king. When we first met Saul in the Bible, he was just a farmer. As a farmer, one day his father Kish of the tribe of Gentlemen said at breakfast, Saul, some of our donkeys have broken out of the coral, corral. I want you to take one of the men, go see if you can go find them and get them, bring them back. So this young man, Saul, close to 30 years old, used to the quiet, simple life on the farm, gathered some supplies and left with a servant and went out looking for jackasses. And after a couple days out searching, he met the prophet of God, Samuel, and they spent some time together. Later that evening, after they had spent time together, Samuel said, tell your servant to go down the road a bit. And Saul did, go on down the road a bit. We'll see you in a few seconds. Then the prophet Samuel said, kneel. And Saul then knelt before the man of God. Then the man of God took out the oil of anointing and poured it over the head of this young farmer, Saul, and said, God has chosen you to be the first king of Israel. I now anoint you king of Israel. 
And the oil went down his face and into his beard. And the man that knelt down in the dirt as a farmer rose from the dirt a king. What would you do? Now he had to go home with that awesome, burdensome secret that he is going to be the king. That he now will, he will have to rule. That he will be responsible. That he will be accountable. Two extremely heavy words. Responsible and accountable. To hear those words applied to you makes you feel very heavy. What does he do with that? Samuel then tells him, oh, the time will come. It will be announced and it will be public. Don't do anything about it now. Just go back home. Keep it secret for a while. I'll be back in touch. And then he heads back home. Saul heads back to his chores on the farm chasing donkeys, emptying waste baskets, working in the fields, cleaning the stables, fixing the fence posts, gathering manure so it can be fertilized for the crops. This lets us know, and this lets all of us know that even though God has put something special and great inside of you, sometimes you still have to shovel some manure. Sometimes you still have to work in the fields. Sometimes you still have to do your chores. Never think that you are too big to clean stables and work hard in the fields. But Saul has to do all of these things quietly, secretly carrying the burden of future greatness, that he's going to be king. He had to have been terrified. So when we see him in our text 40 years or so later, we have to wonder what happened to him. Why is he here on the floor of this tent crying? A man who should be on the throne, a man who should be standing strong on the battlefield, unwavering before his troops as a symbol of courage and victory, is lying on the dirt in a fortune teller's tent, crying and desperate, saying, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. What happened? Now, Bible scholars disagree. Some have said that he was predestined. Some have said that he was God forsaken. Some have said doomed. Others have said that Paul was, that Saul was a pawn of God, appointed by God to fail. God said to Israel, you want a king? Fine. You want to be like everybody else? Fine. All right. Here's your king. Remember you asked for it. But I don't believe that God set Saul up to fail. God simply doesn't do that. I have to believe that God knows the thoughts that he has towards us. Thoughts of peace. That we would have a future and a hope. Some have said that Paul soon became prideful and full of himself and started calling his own shots. Started believing his own press. But for some reason, that too seems too easy. It makes Paul too simplistic. You see, even us here are more complex than that. But in seeking to understand Paul in some strange way, I sometimes begin to feel a little sorry for Brother Saul. Not Paul, but Brother Saul. King Saul. As we look at closer at the actions of King Saul, there is a repetition of a phrase that repeatedly came up in the Old Testament that begins to haunt him, and finally it begins to destroy Saul. It is a phrase that at one time or another in all of our lives, we have all fallen 
victim to, no matter who we are, and we've all uttered it. And that phrase is, I did what the people around me wanted. What we thought those around us should do. The people wanted it. But what will the people say? What will my friends say? What will my colleagues say? What will the people at church say? There was about to be a big battle with the Philistines and there was to be a great worship service and sacrifice because that's what the people of God did before a battle. It's what we should do before a battle. All of the people of God were gathered and the prophet was late. Samuel was late. How the prophet going to be late to the church service? I need to make sure I'm on time every service that I don't keep the deacon board waiting. But Samuel was late. The people said, you know, we're not going to wait much longer. Some of the people said, well, Saul, you're the king. Why don't you just preside at the altar as priest? And Saul did. He's in the middle of giving the text for the sacrifice and the sermon when Samuel shows up. Saul, what are you doing? Well, 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 the the people said, go ahead, Saul. But Saul, you're not ordained of God to do this, Saul. But the people wanted me to. Samuel says, well, that's going to cost you. Before another important battle, Saul said, we must have the favor of God if we are to win this battle. I now declare among all of my troops that there will be fasting. No soldier, no soldier shall eat. Until the battle, we must be in prayer and in repentance before God. Now, beloved, that was a rash emotional proclamation because soldiers need their strength if they're going to fight. Soldiers need to eat. And then the word came that one of the soldiers that he heard had been eating. Saul commands, bring him here. And he sees that it is his own son, Jonathan, that had eaten one of his best soldiers. You see, Jonathan hadn't heard the proclamation of the king because he was off on a special mission procuring weapons and supplies that would help the army of Israel. Jonathan said, well, yes, I have broken the law. I've broken the fast. I now know the punishment. But the people said, oh, cut the boy some slack. My goodness. A little bread and honey, that ain't going to hurt. What's the big deal? And the people said, and there it is again right there. And the people said, so Saul let it ride. Another example, after the defeat of the great army of the Amalekites, the word of God was clear. We go not, we do not go into war in order to collect spoils and take property in the possessions of our enemies. Therefore, to prevent the greed and the selfishness and everything, everything that you take is to be destroyed. God said, burn everything. Don't keep anything for yourselves. Israel goes forth following the word of the Lord and wins the battle. After that, Samuel went to the battlefield. And when Samuel comes upon the victorious army with Saul out there partying and he hears something, he hears the bleeding of lambs and the mooing of the cows. He says to Paul, what is this? The lowing of the herd and the bleeding of the sheep. Saul said, well, well, the people. Samuel said, look, you know the law. Everything was supposed to be destroyed. But the people said, why don't we save some of it and have a big celebration and thank God for the victory? We'll put it in offering and we'll sacrifice some of the captured livestock. Samuel looks at him and says, to obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. 
but the people said. I like to think that in cases like that, you know, their whole herd might have had mad cow disease. And if they had kept the herd, then they would have infected all of the people of Israel. But that's a whole other story. I'm not, I'm not an animal biologist. I wasn't there. But the people said, the people said, it seems that Saul had this insatiable appetite for public approval. An appetite for public approval can be a very dangerous thing if you are in leadership. Saul was intoxicated by the applause and the approval of the people, of those around him. He wanted more views. He wanted more likes on his page and on his posts. He had to have that applause and that approval. And in my assessment, that's what brought him down. In 1 Samuel 15 and 24, he admits it. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. But beloved, let's not forget that when he started, he was nothing but a farm boy that started off looking for his father's jackasses. That's possibly what he secretly longed for in his heart. He probably wished that every once in a while he could be back on the farm where life was simple. Remember, I remember the good old days when all I needed to do was be on the farm where life was simple and predictable and he was not accountable for so much. He was not responsible for so much, where there wasn't so much pressure, so many people watching and second guessing his every move and trying to take his measure all the time, every time, and every day was a weight on his shoulders. You see, the pressures of life weigh equally heavy on all of us. But take a look, really take a look at the faces of those who have served in leadership, even those who have served as president. The weight of leadership, of sitting in that chair, being responsible for the lives of millions, has a way of making those men look very old. When President Obama got elected, all of his hair was black. By the time that brother left office, When I became pastor, my goatee was black. And I only been here for two years. I got up and said, ooh, what was that? <laughs> it has a way, leadership has a weight that it carries with it. So many would love to rule, but we forget that heavy is the head that wears the crown. And it's different when you know that you were trained and qualified to wear the crown. But what if one day you were just working on a farm and you left home one morning a farm hand and you came home anointed king? In 1 Samuel 9 and 21, he even tried to disqualify himself. At his coronation, when they were looking for him to crown him king, they were like, all right, where's Saul? We, we need to crown him king. Come. Where's Saul? He was off hiding in, with the equipment. He probably lived in constant fear that one day the whole kingdom was going to find out that he was a fake. They call it pretender syndrome in psychological circles. It's why he needed their approval and their applause so much. Why else would he want to kill one of his most capable supporters, one of his most capable soldiers over the lyrics of a song? After a day of great victory, when David was returning to the kingdom, the women sang a song that said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. They probably had a remix to it too. 
When Saul heard that song, he flew into a jealous rage. Saul was so insecure in my assessment that he could not stand for someone else to be praised or acknowledged. He felt that he was the one that deserved all of the acolytes and praise. Some people don't like it when other people are acknowledged and applauded for. They don't take their player hater medicine in the morning. Everybody's supposed to take their player hater medicine every morning. <laughs> he looked for approval and acknowledgement from others when he should have been looking for approval and acknowledgement from Almighty God. The people wanted me to. Why could Saul just not have been satisfied by just touching his, his beard and, and touching his head and remembering the feel of the oil of God's anointing and approval that day when he met Samuel. Why couldn't he remember that? Why couldn't he just say, it doesn't matter what the people say. It doesn't matter what the people say. God knows that I am king. God made me king. As long as God is happy, that's all that matters. God's assessment and acknowledgement is truly the only assessment and the acknowledgement that matters. But because he spent so much time, so much attention listening for the approval of the people and those around him, he sooner or later could no longer hear the voice of the Lord. Sooner or later, he cut himself off from God. First Chronicles 10 and 13, it says, so Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord, therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David the son of Jesse, a tragic, tragic end for someone that was so chosen, that was so anointed, or that was so close to God. Today, we sometimes seem to be inquiring in all the wrong places, beloved. You see us today looking every place we can for answers. I think that we can all agree that we are living in uncertain times. Just this past week proved that to us, that we are all living in uncertain times. We're, we're geared to worrying about the future. In these times of uncertainty, we have a tendency to inquire of whatever it is that seems to give off some kind of certainty. We look to whatever seems to give off some kind of stability, some kind of strength, no matter who is offering it. That's why there seemed to be such a strong statement last week. People want to know what's going to happen. The stockbroker bases their life's decisions on what the quotes say that day of the stock market. Some of us look at daytime talk shows or listen to our favorite news outlet, hoping to gain some kind of insight into our situations. You have to make sure that you are inquiring of the right place. You can't ask just anybody what you should do about life-altering situations and decisions. You can't spend all of your time on social media to see what to do and how to act. You can't look to Instagram and Twitter to see what you should do about your marriage, about life's big decisions. They may be there to entertain you, but they can't give you guidance. Most of the time, people around you give you guidance based on their own limited perspectives and their own limited experience and how they feel at that moment. In our limitations as humans, that's the only advice that we can give each other. Most of us can't step outside of ourselves and how we feel at the moment. 
That's why we're told again in our title and in our text of this morning, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not in your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Which brings us to Saul's successor, King David. You see, in King David, we have an example of someone who did the exact opposite of what Saul did in his life. It has always been said that David was a man after God's own heart. It was King David that is said to be the first of the great kings of Israel. And even though David had his issues, Christ our Messiah came out of the house of David seed of Abraham. How does one become a man or a woman after God's own heart? We know his resume. Started off as a shepherd boy, learning to play the harp, learning how to write poetry, learning how to fight and use a sling, warrior, worshiper, And even though he made some very big mistakes, one in particular for which he paid dearly, he is still seen as a man after God's own heart. I wanna know how to do that. Some have said it was because he was so willing to admit when he made a mistake and that he was so repentant. Some have said that he praised God so passionately, remembering when he danced himself out of his kingly robes to give the Lord praise. He wasn't concerned with how he looked before people when praising the Lord when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to its rightful place. He said, I don't care how I look to y'all. God made me king and he danced himself right out of his kingly robe. But like Saul, there is a phrase that is used to describe more than a few instances why in the word why David was so successful as king. Just like Saul had a phrase, but the people said, David had a phrase associated with him. And that phrase was, and David inquired of the Lord. You see, consistently asking God for direction instead of people. Like Saul did, what's like Saul, I mean, asking for what the people wanted like Saul did, that's what made David a man after God's own heart. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. David was always inquiring of the Lord and that's what made him a man after God's own heart. First Samuel 23 and two, therefore David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Kila. First Samuel 23 and four, then David inquired of the Lord once again and the Lord answered him and said, arise and go to Keola, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Again, 1 Samuel 30 and eight. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him saying, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them without fail and recover all. 2 Samuel 5 and 19, again, so David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them to my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. 2 Samuel 5 and 23, did therefore David inquired of the Lord and he said, well, you shall not go up and circle around behind them and come upon them from in front of the mulberry trees. In fact, David went from being the most wanted man in Israel, public enemy number one, to being the king is a miracle in and of itself. 
but it happened because David was always inquiring of the Lord. Even when he was a wanted criminal being pursued all over the land, he seemed to have a habit of inquiring of and crying out to the Lord. He had a habit of asking God for directions about which way he should go. These cries soon turn into the Psalms about God's provision and protecting. They turn into the testimonies about what happens when you inquire, when you acknowledge him. Eventually, they turn into Psalms 40, 1 through 5, where David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. When you inquire of the Lord, when you acknowledge him, the Lord says in Isaiah 41, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see when David inquired of the Lord, When you, being a son or a daughter of God, acknowledge him in all of your ways, he'll let you know some things. He'll let you know like David, you'll be able to say, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you saved me from violence. I will call, I will acknowledge the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. When you ask the Lord for directions, he will let you know, like Isaiah 54 and 17, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and you shall refute every tongue that rises up against you in judgment. This is the heritage of those who inquire of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. No matter who is in office, no matter what's going on out there, you'll be reminded that God is our refuge. And that is if either one of them won the election. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. After acknowledging the Lord, he'll let you know that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Beloved, that's what you get when you live your life asking God for directions. That's what you get when you acknowledge him in all of your ways. Don't waste your time asking around you what you should do. Ask the one that truly has the answers. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Oh, give the Lord praise on this morning. Hallelujah. We might not have all of the answers, but we know how to ask who does have all of the answers. Oh, come on, give the Lord praise of me on this morning. Hallelujah. I'm done. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. Hallelujah. Everyone standing. Let's worship the Lord on today. Jesus, something special, supernatural about. Oh, come on, sing with me. Jesus, something happens when I mention your name. Jesus, 
something special, supernatural about that name, Jesus. Something happens when I mention your name, Jesus. Something special. Oh, come on, beloved, worship him today. About the name Jesus. Something happens when I mention your name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. heads bowed as the band and these beautiful singers sing quietly all heads bowed all eyes closed we are now at the most important time of our service we've sang his praises we've heard his word we've worshiped him but now it's time for someone to make a decision our God our Father our creator is who we should be inquiring of. He is who we should be asking for directions. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Some of us here have been looking in so many different directions to find out what we should be doing in our lives. We have been inquiring of everything else and everyone else to find direction in our lives. When we should be inquiring of the Lord about what we should do, who we should be. But beloved, I believe that there is somebody here today that is ready to inquire of the Lord about what they should do with their life and their future. I believe that there's someone here that wants more for their life than what the world has been giving them up to this point. You see, by giving your life to Jesus Christ, you are putting yourself in position to inquire, to acknowledge almighty God of the universe, to hear what he would have to say to you. You might already be saved. You might already be in relationship. But if there is an area in your life that you are seeking his direction in, come on down here. We want to pray with you. We want to stand with you. We love you. We believe in you. Come on. If there is an area of your life that you simply want more, that you want the guidance of the Holy Spirit in, come on forward. If you're trying to figure out if you should go into that business venture, if you're wondering what you should do about your relationship with your son and your daughter, your son and your daughter isn't acting right. If you're wondering what about what you should do in your career, even if you're wondering about what major you wanna go into in college, come on down, we wanna pray with you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Something happens when I call you. Jesus, 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 something happens when I call you, Jesus, 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 something happens when I call you. Jesus, Jesus, something special, supernatural, 
see your children coming before you. Their coming before you is a declaration, Father God, that even in the middle of all of their circumstances and situations in their life, they are looking to you for guidance. And your sons and daughters inquired of the Lord as to what they should do about their relationships, as to what they should do about their finances as to what they should do about their marriages, about their children, about their jobs, about their very lives. Father God, your sons and daughters have come before your altar inquiring of you what they should do, Father God. And Father God, you promised us that come what may, that you would never leave or forsake us even until the end of this age. So Father God, you see your children coming before you for guidance. And Lord God, I might not know what circumstances they are facing in their homes and in their families, Father God, but your spirit knows, but you and all of your power knows. So Father God, we pray that you would surround them with your will, surround them with your presence, surround them with your purpose, Surround them with your power. Lead them in the way that they should go. And Father God, we thank you that you are going to bring them the victory because in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, there is power. There is liberation. There is freedom. There is wisdom. There is direction. There is purpose. There is future. So Father God, we thank you for your children. And Lord God, there may be someone here that is now ready to inquire of you as to what they should do with their entire life. There are those, Father God, that life has tried everything that it can to tear them down and to tell them that they are worthless. But Father God, we thank you that you have made us and that you have made us fearfully and wonderfully. So Father God, we thank you for those that are now ready to give their life to you, that are now ready to let your son, Jesus, into their hearts. So please repeat after me. Dear precious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for sending your son to die for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I believe that he came down to die for my sins. And I believe that he rose again on the third day. And I now ask that he forgive me for the wrong that I have done. I now ask that he forgive me for the wrong that I have been. That he forgive me for inquiring in all the wrong places. I now ask that he come into my heart right now. In the name of Jesus. And I now thank him that he's going to give me the victory. That he's going to give me all the guidance that I need. And that I, as I acknowledge him, he will direct me in all of my ways. So we praise the Lord for the victory on the day, beloved. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, beloved. Let's give the Lord praise on today. Amen. <laughs> Beloved, if you gave your life to the Lord, you have now stepped into a beautiful and victorious future. But I want to let you know that you're not alone. That as you move forward and go deeper into God's word and dig deeper into inquiring and acknowledging for the, of the Lord what you should do with your life, that we want to be with you every step of the way. That as you plug into him and plug into his word and seek his face more, he will give you the guidance and the insight that you need to live victoriously. 
But we want you to know that you're not going to have to do that by yourself. There is a whole church out there that is, wants to stand with you, that wants to pray with you, my brother. We want to go onward and upward and higher with you. But in order to do that, we need to know who you are. We want to spend a little bit of time with you, not more than five to ten minutes. We want to get your name, your cell phone number, your email address so that we can write you, that we can send you word and encouragement because we want to go onward and upward with you. We want to join with you. We want you to join the West Angeles family. As I said before, we will be a better church because of you. We will be a better church and we will do more for the Lord because of you. The kingdom and people will be blessed because of what God has put inside of each and every one of you. So we want to lock arms with you. If you would, Elder John Patton is standing right there with his hand up. We're just going to go right to where that exit sign is right there. We just want to get your name and your cell phone number. We just want to text you. If you're online, watch us with us online. Just go to our app. There should be a QR code up there to where you can scan that code and you too can join with us wherever you may be. Let's give the Lord praise for our brothers on today. Jesus, something special, supernatural about the name. I hope you all were blessed by that word on today. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Let's give one more praise for the victory on today. Well, beloved, again, I want to thank you for worshiping the Lord with us on today. Keep on seeking his face. Keep on believing in him. He whose mind is stayed on him. I will keep him in perfect peace. Amen. Well, they, they want me to make sure that I announce again that Thanksgiving service is going to happen for us on that Sunday. We will not have a Thanksgiving service on Thanksgiving officially. We want you to be able to be at home with your families, but we will be celebrating Thanksgiving on that Sunday before Thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. So there will not be service here on the 28th, on that day. Dear precious Heavenly Father, we wanna thank you, Father God, that come what may, we can look to you to know what it is that we should do. That we can acknowledge you in all our ways and you will direct our path. So Father God, we pray that as we go down from this place, that you will cover us with your protection and your purpose. Father God, please, protect us and continue to make us one in you. Teach us how to love each other all the more, how to look out for each other, how to pray for each other. Teach us how to walk in your victory and in your power. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. you. We love you.